chapter 5. We're going to read verses 8 to 11. Last week, we, we took the next step in this one anothering series, having looked at loving one another, that core command of Jesus Christ, uh, motivated by the love of God, exemplified in those who are friends of Christ. We looked at serving one another and suggested to you that, that we need to avoid legalism. That's one ditch because it's self-serving. Rule keeping is self-serving. We need to, av to avoid licentiousness, the other ditch, because it too, uh, a libertine attitude of playing fast and loose as if there is no uh, command of Jesus to instruct us. Uh, living the way we want to, uh, that also is self-serving. And so today, with that in mind, I want us to look at this call to encourage and edify one another or encourage and build up one another. And we find this uh, in one place, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 18. If you have found that in your Bibles, uh, and would you stand with me? And if you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen for you. Listen to this. Paul is closing this letter. He's exhorting them to live as those who belong to the day. In other words, live in the light, not as those who belong to the dark, who slip around, whose deeds are evil. Listen to this. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, that's a play on words for living or, or dead, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. What have we read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And we pray that the Lord will help us to recognize that if we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us, as Joshua said, it's not natural to encourage one another. But if we have been born again, there is a supernatural indicator, a supernatural reality, who if we yield ourselves to Him, will make us encouragers one of another. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, Encouragement does not come natural. It does not grow on Adam's vine. Go back to the garden. Before our first parents fell into sin, they were, you could say, lost in worship of God and wonder of one another, living to bless one another, living to please one another. Not self-absorbed, but other-absorbed. And then sin came. And what happens? The blame game. The criticism game. The unwillingness to own up. To say, I have sinned. Rather to say, she sinned. He sinned. Begin to point fingers. Point out faults in the other. This woman you gave me. We can go ahead and fill it in is defective, criticized. Your creation, the serpent, is defective. And then we're saved. The new birth comes. We're made partakers of the divine nature. And in that, being born again, where the Spirit inhabits us, makes us new, gives us the privileges and promises of the new covenant. Something changes. But it's a battle. That's why we not only need to be justified, we need to be engaged in ongoing sanctification because it's a battle. And here's where the battle lines are. So I want you to see from this text today with, with the loving one another as the engine that drives this whole discussion of one anothering living in a gospel community. 
serving one another as, as a way to, to slay remaining sin and selfishness. One of the outgrowths of that is encouraging and building up one another. This text points out we are equipped to encourage and edify or encourage and build up one another. We are motivated to encourage and build up one another, and we are exhorted to encourage and build up one another. Let's see how it teaches us this. First of all, we are equipped to encourage and build up one another. Verse 8, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. First Thessalonians is one of the early letters Paul wrote. He develops this idea of the armor, the spiritual armor, when he gets to Ephesians 6, which he writes a little later, Ephesians 6, where he says, put on the whole armor of God. Here, in this passage, he references a portion of it. You see, people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. That's a description of us who've been saved. Yet there are many who still sit in darkness. There are many who still live in the night. Uh, John 3 says, they will not come to the light, for their deeds are evil. But we, who have been saved by grace through faith, born again, born anew, born from above, have, been, have had the gospel revealed to us. The scripture is breathed out to us, inspired to us. We are illumined and constantly being illumined by the Word of God. I pray that as we go through this series that there'll be some, some lights coming on for some of you. That doesn't necessarily mean you've just been saved. It, it could for some, but it primarily means that you have been illumined. Truth has come uh, not only to the head, but to the heart. It grips the heart. It shapes and changes the heart. He says, we're equipped to encourage one another. We belong to the day. So, he calls us to a sobriety, to a, to a seriousness. Not a sadness, a seriousness. We, the, the Christian life should be a, a dignified sobriety. It should be a solemn joyfulness. We should find ourselves delighting in the opportunity to encourage one another, to build one another up. We put on the breastplate of faith and love. Notice this. The love of God. Faith in Christ. Trusting Him. Wanting to be like Him. He went about doing good. We want to be like Him. We will go about doing good. If we're not intentionally committed to that, we will accidentally, incidentally, find ourselves living a week without go doing good. We intentionally, intensely, committedly do these things. He calls us to this since we do this. And then the helmet, the hope of salvation. In Ephesians 6, it's the helmet of salvation. Here he emphasizes the hope. We were hopeless at one point. We were without God. Ephesians 2 tells us. We were aliens to the blessings and the promises. But God, who is rich in mercy, saved us. When He saved us, He gave us hope. I was watching and, and showed to uh, the folks last Sunday night the extended trailer of the, of the Founders Ministries Synodoc, the, the video documentary we're trying to, to raise the funds for to, to get into the hands of every pastor in the Southern Baptist Convention by way of a, of a video DVD in the hopes that we can stem the tide of cultural Marxism that is invading our denomination. Uh, the social justice movement, which is simply the, the Trojan horse to introduce cultural Marxism into our churches, into our denominational structure. We're trying to get that out. And in that synodoc, this, the extended one now, the 14, 15 minute one, Dr. Tom Nettles is talking about how this movement undermines the hope of the gospel. And he makes this little line, it is, it is, it is the blessed hope that helps us cope. And that's true. We had no coping mechanism before we were saved. But the blessed hope of Jesus Christ 
helps us cope. Salvation is a helmet. It's, it captures the mind. It's what, it's what Douglas Wilson calls thinking Christianly. Thinking like a Christian. So we are equipped to encourage one another. Secondly, we are motivated to encourage and edify one another. Look at verses 9 and 10. For God has not destined us to wrath. Where's your destiny today? Well, I can tell you, if you have not consciously committed yourself to Jesus Christ as your Lord, then you are destined at this point in your life to wrath. Your destiny, when you breathe this earth's last breath, you will find yourself eternally under the wrath of God if you've not come to Christ. But he says here, God has not destined us for wrath, but... So you, you, you insert, he's destined us to obtain salvation. This idea of obtaining salvation. I remind you, salvation happens for us in three tenses. We have been saved from the penalty of sin, justification. We are being saved from the power of sin, that's ongoing or progressive sanctification. We shall be saved from the very presence of sin, that is glorification, and we, we obtain, it's the final obtaining, it's the final goal, it's the final reality. It's like being notified that you, that, that as a child, uh, in your minority, that when you reach your majority, when you reach maturity, the legal age, that you will be the recipient of an endowment, of a trust left for you. You have it. As a child, you'll get it in its fullness as an adult. So we're going to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's described for us here, who died for us, so that, so here's, here's a purpose expressed. Whether we are awake or asleep, if we're awake, if we're alive, we live for him. If we're asleep, if we've died already, those who have died to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord are living not only for Him, but living with Him. The goal of Jesus Christ, shedding His life blood for sinners, is that those who live on this earth will live for Him while they live. And when they come to die, they will die in Him, go to live with Him forever and ever. So we're motivated. If that doesn't motivate you, talk to me after the service because either I haven't communicated well or we need to unstop your ears. We're motivated to encourage and edify one another. And then we are exhorted to encourage one another. We want to dig down here. We're exhorted to encourage one another. Therefore, in the light of the fact that we're equipped, in the light of the motivation set before us, there's an exhortation that comes. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. This word translated encourage, attached with the one another phrase that we've already studied as we began this series, is a word that finds its root in the word that is used to describe the Holy Spirit. Parakaleo. Para, alongside. Kaleo, to be called alongside. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. You may have heard this, the term, the paraclete. You may have seen that used. Some people read that and they mispronounce it. Parakete. It's not parakete. Paraclete. The paraclete is the one who comes alongside. He dwells in us at the new birth. And he functions as one who comforts. He is the instructor. He is the, in, he's the teacher. What Paul is saying here is, if you have been saved, if you are a person of the day, living in the light, part of your function, part of the evidence in your life that the Holy Spirit dwells in your life is that you will be one of these people. You will be one who encourages. You will be one who comes alongside. While it is true that you can encourage other people by writing notes or texts or emails 
or making phone calls, and I would encourage all of those for you to engage in all of those with people. They finally are no substitute for coming alongside. Coming alongside has the sense of touch. You get the picture. He comes alongside it and puts his arm around his shoulder to encourage. Now, I will not expose the name of the person Josh referenced a while ago in this mindset that has manifested itself in our family. I will simply say for him that the apple does not fall far from the tree. All right? We need to put our arms around one another and encourage. And I'm guilty because I do point out the good. Now, there was a time in my life, to my shame, that most of what I did was point out the bad with a wrong mentality, an immature mentality. Well, they, they know what, what to do. It's good. We need to correct it. We need to encourage one another and learn increasingly to, to build one another up without tearing one another down. There is constructive criticism. Now, we're, not, we're not getting out of that, just striking that from the record because the Scripture is profitable for that, Paul says in 2 Timothy. But the point here is come alongside. It, it involves touch is my point. Touch. Have you ever thought about the value of touch? Have you ever wondered how many people you're around, maybe even in close proximity to, who are starving for touch, who are weary, who are discouraged? Just a simple grip of the hand, your human touch. Have you read the stories about the about the orphan infants in some of these third world countries that when they're adopted uh, by, by good, godly parents, they discover that they, they are malnourished from touch. And when they begin to be touched and, and held and, and hugged, they begin to develop emotionally. Well, that's true of us spiritually. A wave is kind. How are you is kind. But the picture here of the Holy Spirit, because He dwells within us, we, if we have the Spirit in us, if we want to expand and enhance the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we will come alongside. We will encourage. Never underestimate the value of that. Never let the enemy of our souls tell you, your words of comfort won't mean anything to them. That's a lie. Your words of encouragement don't mean anything to them. That's not true. Our spouses need it. Our children need it. Children, your parents need it. Your grandparents need it. Church members, we need it, brothers and sisters. Because we are constantly battling a threefold enemy. The world, which is going to hell as quickly as it can. The flesh which we fight the corruption, remaining corruption of the flesh, our disappointments with ourselves, our discouragements with ourselves, sometimes our loathing of ourselves, of what we find within us, and sometimes an unhealthy self-loathing that carries over from childhood, from bad relational experiences. And then the devil, who is a liar and the father of lies. I will remind you, I've said this to you recently, the devil used the scriptures to lie to Jesus. Don't think that any tool is beyond his grasp or beyond his willingness to use, to lie to you. He will lie to you about yourself, pointing out flaws in you, pointing out hypocrisy in you and me. He will lie to you about others. We need to fight this with the weapons God has given us. Paul calls them in 2 Corinthians the weapons of our warfare. He says they're not carnal, but they are mighty. And one of these mighty weapons that we can use is to encourage one another, to build one another. So I'll just ask you this. When's the last time you intentionally stepped forward? to come alongside, 
you realize you can't do that at a distance. You can't do that in absence. When you do it, let me encourage you, let me challenge you to commit to be an encourager, one with another. Don't be a husband like the husband I read about in a joke one time when his wife said, you don't tell me you, you love me anymore. And he said, I told you I loved you when we got married. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. Don't be that kind of husband. Encourage. Bless. So we have this exhortation. Look at some scriptures with me real quickly. For this idea is used. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, where Paul is opening up this, this letter. We went through 1 Corinthians. This is the follow-up letter to it. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, God of all comfort, who comforts us. And there he's using that word here. This is the word when he says comfort. He's the God of all encouragement or comfort. Who comforts us in all our affliction so that, think about this, has God ever comforted you? Why did he do that? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort. He's, he is lovingly, if you want the idea of a velvet brick, uh, he is beating the Corinthians over the head with this idea. The word comes up over and over. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Count them now. How many times that word shows up in those two verses? We're to encourage. He's the God of all encouragement. Paul says it this way in, 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 in Philippians 2. If there's, any, if there's any encouragement, if you found any encouragement in the gospel, well, then be of one mind. Use that as the connecting point for others who found encouragement. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. Remember, this is the fellow he said in 1 Corinthians, expel him, excommunicate him from the assembly. Well, he repented, remember? He repented. Paul said, I've heard this and I'm thrilled to hear it. Now, the, major, the punishment of the majority is enough, so you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. You see, just as it's important to rebuke, we need to demonstrate an encouragement and comfort when one repents. Because the devil is lying and say, you've blown it now. The relationship will never be the same. He's a liar. Demonstrate comfort and encouragement to close that gap. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 6 and 7. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. Do you get this picture here, Paul? Paul is challenging. He's telling them the narrative here. He says, look how God uses encouragement in the body. As he told us of your longing, your mourning, that is your grieving, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still the more. The God who comforts used Titus to comfort us, and you comforted him. See the chain reaction here? Have you ever thought about what a chain reaction you might set off? I think the popular term today is pay it forward. You, personally, can set off a chain reaction in the life of a family, of friends, of neighbors, of a congregation, if you purpose to be the encourager. You know how Barnabas got his name? They called him Barnabas. We don't know if that was his real name. Barnabas, because it means the son of consolation or the son of encouragement. You be the Barnabas. You be the Barnabas. And don't let the devil... You say, we well, you know I tried that one time. No, I, I, I don't try it one time. This is not a choice between soft drinks here. A commitment, a posture. Be the son, be the daughter of encouragement and see what happens. See what happens. God used Barnabas mightily in the early church. Ephesians 6, 22. It's interesting. Paul uses this, this idea twice. You're going to see it in Ephesians 6, 22. And Colossians 4, 8 and 9, he says, I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. 
he is sending a fellow worker here to give a report of Paul's circumstances. And I think behind this, how Paul is rejoicing in the Lord in the midst of his circumstances, and that would be a point of encouragement to them to know that circumstances never get us down. I read one time a fellow said, well, how? So I talked to a believer. How are you doing? He said, well, I'm doing pretty well under the circumstances. He said, what is a believer doing under the circumstances? We don't, we don't miss the circumstances, and we can't avoid them altogether. In this world, you will, have, you will be squeezed, Jesus said. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. That, that gives us our posture here, that he may encourage your hearts. Colossians 4, 8 and 9, I've sent him to you for this very purpose, same language, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved Brother, who is one of you? They will tell you of everything that's taken place here. Paul used his fellow laborers to get word, because they didn't have email, they didn't have texting, they didn't have Twitter, and all the other things that we have here. They had to actually go and tell them. They had to write letters, and they would, and they would get there as quickly as the letter did. In fact, they were typically the ones who carried the letter. They were a role of encouragement. They were extending and demonstrating the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the advance of the gospel in the early church. So Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, after he's talked about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have died to wonder, well, have they missed, have they missed the return of Christ? He says, no. And he gives this description of what will happen. The trumpet will sound and the dead shall be raised and, and we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will be caught up to meet him to the picture there to be brought to usher back in his kingdom and we shall be with the Lord forever therefore comfort or encourage one another with these words you get discouraged sometimes you read the new my dear friends my brothers and sisters in Christ in Louisiana are devastated this morning devastated somehow and I'm guessing it's because 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 dead Democrats vote a lot and illegal Democrats vote a lot and, and some Democrats just just vote often. This this wicked, worthless governor of Louisiana was reelected. It seemed impossible. He's led the state to be the worst in nearly every category. They're devastated. Well, they need encouragement. Jesus is coming. The re-election of this scoundrel has not postponed, delayed, thrown off the return of Jesus one millisecond. We need to encourage one another. You get discouraged? Pray to God that you'll find encouragement in the fact that Jesus is coming back. All that looks wrong right now, all that is wrong with our society is going to be corrected. It's going to be set right one day. We're to hold forth the gospel. We're to be salt, try to hold back the decay of the culture and light. Try to drive back the darkness of the, culture, of the culture. That's our responsibility. But hold on. Don't give up. Some are inclined to give up. I've talked with them. They just throw in the towel. What's the use? The use is that we're to be used to glorify God, to, to bless one another, to be salt and light, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, no matter what happens. No matter how quickly the culture around us, both outside the church and inside the church, seems to want to drag everything down to hell. Encourage one another. 2 Thessalonians 6, 2, 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort, there's the word, and uh, or encouragement and good hope through grace. Sometimes you just come back remember the grace of God nothing can Jesus said it this way in John 10 I'm in my father's hands you're in my hands your enemies have to get through two sets of hands of the omnipotent Trinity with the third set of hands holding your heart inside of you that's the implication to get at you you're saved. He's given us eternal comfort. May he comfort your hearts 
and establish them. That is, give you the wherewithal to stand firm in every good work and word. What, what do you think he's talking about here? His good works and words. Encouragement. Encouragement. He's called us to be there. Well, we need to remind ourselves of the encouragement of the gospel sometimes. To, to have the mindset to be an encourager. Remind ourselves that no matter what the circumstances are, He is the God of all encouragement in, through, and over all of that. So that's this word encourage. This word, there's another term, build up or edify here. It is the word that means to, to make nearer to fullness or completion as a person's moral strength or someone's conscience. It's, it's taken from the building uh, mentality uh, in the New Testament. Conceived of as constructing something further. Now, the discussion of sanctification. God is completely committed to our growing in grace. We must be completely committed to our growing in grace ourselves. Justification math is 100% God, 0% the believer. Sanctification math is 100% God, 100% the believer. But we are not allowed to stand by as spectators, as bystanders in one another's sanctification. We are either adding to it or we are allowing it to stagnate. Are you building others up? That's what we just read from Ephesians 4. He gives these, he gives apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers to equip the saints, that is to give you the tools to do the work of the ministry, the work of the ministry there. We get our word deacon from the work there, diakonos, from the, from the service of the ministry engaging in that to build up one another. Are you doing that? You see, I said a while ago, we need to intentionally go out of our way to encourage, come alongside and encourage others. Ask yourself, just look around, say, hmm, who have I not encouraged here in a while? Who, sh who should I? How would God bless others to make me a blessing? We say here we're blessed to be a blessing. Same thing is true of this term, to build somebody up, to, to tell them what a blessing they are. To point out, do you realize most people do not recognize their own spiritual gifts? There's a, there, we talked about this when we went through uh, 1 Corinthians. There's a tension here. Nobody wants to be arrogant. You don't sit around and say, you know, I think, I think humility is one of my greatest traits. You, you don't. You don't say that. That's that's contra I mean, it, it totally contradicts the whole notion. People don't do that. We we want to we want to be humble. We we want to be uh, people who don't call attention to ourselves. So there are a lot, I'm talking to people here today who who couldn't name their spiritual gift if you asked them. And it's not because they don't have them. What what if you were the one? So I want you to know how how God blesses my life through you. And you build them up with those encouragements. It's the idea of building up. And so Acts 20, 32, Paul is, is, is wrapping up his discussion with the Ephesian elders at Miletus, the last time he would see them. And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. His, his grace is not only a reality that comes, but it's a, it's a word that comes. It's a strengthening, encouraging word which is able to build you up, there's the word, and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified, to remind you that you are being taken to the port. You are being taken to heaven. You will make it there. You're being transported infallibly, securely by the Holy Spirit. And I want to remind you of that. Someone says, I just don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know how I'll get through this. Uh, the gospel guarantees you'll get through this. He'll bring you safe to the other side. It's grace. 
that's brought me safe thus far and grace will bring me home. 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Now concerning food often to idols, we talked about this when we went through it. We know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You've heard it. You can probably say it with me. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It is the intentional, loving demonstration of building one another up. You can't do this at a distance either. You can't do this apart from the body of Christ. We weren't made to be an island. We were not made to live in isolation. The ecclesia is not our idea. It is God's idea. The called out assembly. Here's the world, saved by grace through faith, called out. It's a part of the called out assembly. But the assembly is the operative word there. <laughs> to gather. The devil loves nothing better than to isolate you, just like a wolf loves nothing better than to get the sheep away from the flock. He loves it. He'll work on you. He'll work on you. So, if you're going to encourage and build up, you've got to commit to be among, in the midst of. It's not rocket science. If you're going to do this, you're committed to plug in to the ecclesia in all its expressions. 1 Corinthians 10, 23, again, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. You see, this is where liberty blossoms, I think. When in liberty, a person denies himself or herself, the first call of the gospel, we looked at that last week, to do that which builds up. Deny yourself to edify somebody else. Deny yourself to build up someone else. Get outside your comfort zone to bring comfort, one of, the, one of the words used for encouragement there, to others. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. The one who speaks in tongues builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Use, use the word to build others up. And then Jude 20, 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up. Watch this here. In your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves of this, but it's a plural. It doesn't say build yourself up. It's build yourselves up. He contemplates here the gathered body where you must sometimes believe the promises of God for you. And then... You pray that as a body is keenly aware of itself, uh, if, if my toe is itching, that I won't go, ah, something else will get that. No, i got fingers that can do that. You see, it's, you're thinking of the well-being of the body. Build, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Again, we're responsible to grow in grace, but as the body of Christ we have a responsibility to one another to be sure that we are, we are conducive instruments to encouraging and provoking growth in grace. We stand by watching at a distance, dispassionate. In fact, you, you cannot be a dispassionate member of the body of Christ. That's a contradiction of terms. Passion, we are passionate. We, we are to feel with one another. We're to weep when one weeps. We're to rejoice when one rejoices. We're to be engaged and involved. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. This, this idea of building up, does it surprise you that it goes back to the notion of the love of God, which is manifest in us so that we might love one another as Jesus has loved us? You see, they intersect, they, they intertwine. They're woven together in a fabric that you cannot, you cannot leave part of it out without damaging the fabric waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Let me ask you. I don't, I'm not going to ask you in a way to shame you. I'm just going to ask you in a way to challenge you. Having seen this, having been reminded of this, because our text says, as you are doing. And it's going on. 
I'm not suggesting by preaching this today that it's not happening at all. It is happening. But my question to you is, do you believe it's happening enough on your part? Do you believe that you're tapped out, that you're maxed out in being an encouragement, in, in being the, the physical manifestation, if I can use this, of the Holy Spirit in someone else's life? To remind them that if they're saved by grace through faith, the Holy Spirit dwells in them and is conforming them to the image of Christ, even when they don't see that conformity, and yet you do, and you have an opportunity to speak that into their lives. Have you come alongside? Enough. Have you put your arms around? Enough. Have you spoken blessing? Enough. Now, we're not going to fall into the snare of the devil accusing us of this, because you see, if he gets to play the game, then it's never enough. But I'm asking you, not him, I'm asking you, do you believe in, in, your, in your walk in the Lord? That you're maxed out here. That you're tapped out. That you, you have been overcome with what, what we call in ministry compassion fatigue. That you need to back off. Or could you see where in your life you could extend your reach and your blessing? More so in the body, in your family, among your friends, your neighborhood, even perhaps your enemies. Be an encouragement. Are you building up? Is the body of Christ being built up through your hands, through your eyes, through your words, through your Visible commitment. And the Lord knows the answer to that. And so do you. And so I simply challenge you today. If we're going to love one another as Jesus has loved us. If we're going to love one another as evidence that we are friends of Jesus. If we're going to love one another as a motivation that flows out of us because of the love of God for us. Because the love of Christ compels us. If we're going to love one another and, and by doing so, serve one another. Are we willing to take the challenge today to step up our game, to encourage one another, to build up one another? Because I promise you, that kind of environment, when it becomes contagious, when it becomes pervasive, that kind of environment is compelling because there's a world of people around you that don't have anybody speaking encouragement into their lives. Don't have anybody saying anything that builds them up. And we, we can be those people. We can be those people. In the gospel, the message of a crucified and risen Savior, the door is thrown open for that conversation as people see the difference that the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is making in our lives. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you now in Jesus' name. We thank you for this passage and, and the companion passages. We know that, that your intention is to give the church what the church needs, that saints may be equipped to expend energy for the ministry, for the service, to you first, to one another, and to others. That we're to love you. We're to love one another. We're to serve the world. Help us, Lord, today to take the challenge, fresh from your word, for those who, who are uh, really advanced, in encouraging and building up. To be strengthened all the more. For those who, at one time in their Christian walk, that this marked out their lives, who have, who have grown weary. Renew today. Strengthen today. For those who have let the enemy of their souls, the world, the flesh, and the devil, intimidate them. Convince them that that for them to engage in this would make no difference. Deliver them from the lie and help them to renew and commit 
to be one who encourages and comforts others, to build up others in the most holy faith. And, and see in that, see in that, that we are growing in grace as we do those things that we've been commanded to do that make us increasingly conformed to the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For we ask this in his name. Amen. Let's stand together this morning and sing.